let's tie up some loose ends from the first fundamental theorem of calculus. So, statement is, we have F continuous on the closed interval AB. Capital F is gonna be an antiderivative of little f. So we take the derivative of capital F, we get back little f. Then the conclusion is, take the definite integral from A to B of little f of x with respect to x. We'll get capital F evaluated at our endpoints, and then we take the difference. So this is giving us a connection between the definite integral, which we can think of as a net area, okay, between the graph of f and the x-axis, and our antiderivatives. First point, okay, note, we can use any antiderivative in our theorem, assuming that there's at least one. So, if we have at least one, then I can get any other antiderivative by adding a constant. And then, if we do this difference here, you'll note, our constant is gonna go away, leaving us with the original difference. So, won't matter what antiderivative you use, just use the one that's most convenient. Now, the other big question is, okay, this capital F, well, if I have F continuous on the closed interval AB, is there even gonna be a capital F to use? So the question is, if F is continuous on the closed interval AB, can we find an antiderivative? So the answer is gonna be yes. Okay, that's gonna be the point of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So, statement here, we have F continuous on the closed interval AB, so as before, we take some C inside the open interval, and then we're gonna define capital F of X equal to definite integral from C to X of little f of T with respect to T. So here, since I'm using X in the function, we're gonna use the dummy variable T here for our integration. Conclusion, if we take X in the open interval AB, the derivative of capital F evaluated X is gonna be equal to little f of X. So that means our capital F of X is an antiderivative for little f. Okay, now, another way we could write this, but I don't wanna make reference to capital F of X, I could write this as D dx, okay, of our integral, you have the x in the upper limit, it's gonna be equal to f of x. So this gets rid of mention of our antiderivative. Now you'll note, as with first fundamental theorem of calculus, okay, the idea here is gonna be, if you take integration differentiation, they cancel each other out. So here what we have, if you take integration in this manner, so we take our old function, make a new function, take the derivative, get back to your old function. So the idea is when we use second fundamental theorem of calculus, you have the x up here, you're just gonna take your inside function, replace the t with an x. Okay, what's happening here? Well, our capital F of x, what's that geometrically? That's measuring the area between the graph of f and the x-axis between c and the point x. So here we have an area function. If I wanna take the derivative of that area function, that's just taking the graph of the area function. You fix your x, you take the tangent line, you take the slope. So if we take the slope of the tangent line to our area function, you get back your original function. Before we get to the proof, let's take a look at some concrete examples. First example, f of x equals m times x, where m is a constant. So here, the graph is gonna be a straight line through the origin with slope equal to m. We compute capital F of x, so I take the definite integral from zero to x, of mt with respect to t. So I want the antiderivative of t to the one. Okay, we add one, divide, I get one half t squared. We put the m back in. We evaluate x and zero, take the difference, we get one half mx squared. Now, we take a look at our picture. Okay, we're looking between zero and x under the graph, so the base is gonna have length x, the height of our triangle is gonna be mx. So, 
you get one half x mx for the area of the triangle. So capital F of x is definitely going to be our area function for between 0 and x. We take the derivative. So bring the 2 down, drop the exponent by 1. Derivative of capital F is just going to be mx, and that's my original function. So to recall what's happening in pictures, to go from little f to capital F, okay, at x, here we just take the area under the graph, and then that's going to give us the value of capital F. So we're going from a straight line to a parabola, okay, from mx to a half mx squared. If I want to go in the other direction, what do we do? We take our point x, okay, we find the point on the graph, we take the tangent line, we take the slope of that tangent line, that slope gets us back to our function f of x. Where the second fundamental theorem of calculus pays off is when we're looking at a function where there's no rule for the antiderivative. So if I take f of x equal to 1 over x, it's x to the minus 1. That's the case we avoid in our power rule. So if we add 1 and divide, adding 1 gets to 0, and then we don't want to divide by that. So we just avoid this case. Now, f is going to be continuous when x is greater than 0. So second fundamental theorem of calculus says this function has an antiderivative, and it's given by this definition here. So we'll take capital F of x, it's going to be equal to definite integral from 1 to x, so I'm choosing my base point at 1, of 1 over t with respect to t. The point here is we can't use the first fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate this. We don't have an antiderivative for 1 over t, so this is going to be the definition of the antiderivative. Now, if I want to know this function at points, I have to go back to my limit definition. So for instance, if I want capital F at 1, okay, I put 1 in for x, take a definite integral from 1 to 1, it's always going to be a 0. Okay, when the limits are equal, 0 comes out because you're taking the area of a line segment. So on the graph, we plot that point there. If we take capital F at 2, so we have definite integral from 1 to 2, 1 over t with respect to t, this is just going to be the area okay, going from 1 to 2 under the graph of 1 over t. So we're looking at this area right here. Now to find that, I just go back to my limit definition. So I take the limit of a sum, okay, we're going to have a partition. We're going to take our function evaluated at points in the partition times the width of your interval. So if you work this out, okay, to take your limit, you're just going to take n bigger and bigger. Okay, so I took n equal to 10,000, and that's enough to get me to my 0.693. And that's in the ballpark of natural log of 2. So a punchline for a later chapter is going to be, okay, this antiderivative is actually equal to natural log of x. All right, so that gives me another point. At 2, we have 0.693. Now, other things we can get. So what else do we care about when we graph? Well, if we take the derivative here, remember the rule is, if you have x there, constant there, to take the derivative with respect to x, I just take our function, wherever I see the t, I put an x. So the first derivative is going to be equal to 1 over x. So if x is greater than 0, what's going to happen? Well, the derivative is always going to be positive, so that's going to mean we're increasing when we're greater than 0. We could also get concavity. If I take the derivative of capital F prime, okay, well, it's just derivative of x to the minus 1. So I get a minus x to the minus 2, or a minus 1 over x squared. So when x is positive, okay, well, x squared is positive. Then we put a negative in front, so it's always negative. So we're going to be concave down on this region. So it's going to be increasing, concave down, goes to these two points. So it looks something like this. Okay, if you go and you plot natural log of x, okay, it's going to agree with our picture here. As a final example, some mechanics with the chain rule. So the problem, we have derivative with respect to x, the definite integral from 0 to x squared, square root of 1 plus t to the fourth with respect to t. Now, we would want to use second fundamental theorem of calculus, but we have an x squared in the upper limit instead of an x. 
If we had an X there, the rule would be take the integrand, wherever you see a T, replace it with an X. So the answer would be square root of 1 plus X to the fourth. The key here, set aside the function that you want to work with. So things would be nice if we had capital F of X equal to definite integral from 0 to X, a square root of 1 plus T to the fourth with respect to T. So that we can work with. Now you'll note the function we're looking at right here is just capital F of X squared. Okay, all we're doing is taking the X here, replacing it with an X squared. So if we take the derivative, capital F of X squared, we're just gonna use the chain rule. So what do we do? We take the derivative of capital F, evaluate the inside, which is X squared, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is two X. Now, second fundamental theorem of calculus tells us the derivative of capital F is just gonna be little f, where little f is our integrand. So I'm just gonna take this x squared, put it in where I have a t. So the answer is gonna be two times x times square root of one plus x squared raised to the fourth power, or two times x times square root of one plus x to the eighth. Let's prove our theorem. We're trying to show the derivative of capital F of x, that's the function defined by our definite integral, is equal to little f of x. So we'll start by listing the definitions. So we're gonna have derivative of capital F at x. It's gonna be defined by limit as h goes to zero, capital F at x plus h minus capital F of x divided by h. We route the definition for capital F at each of our points. So for the first term, we'll have definite integral from a to x plus h. a is gonna be our base point, f of t with respect to t. Our next step, we're gonna pull out our rules for manipulating the limits of integration. So if I wanna get rid of this minus sign, I could switch the a and the x. And then, since the a here will match the a there, we can combine this into a single integral. So that'll give me definite integral from x to x plus h of f of t with respect to t. Now, the length of the interval here, we're going from x to x plus h, so it has length h, and then we're dividing by h out in front. So this is gonna be a mean value, okay? In our usual mean value theorem for integration, we'll have one over b minus a, the length of the interval, and then here we'd have a and b. But mean value theorem for integration definitely applies here. So that's gonna say that this mean value here is gonna be equal to our function evaluated at some point x prime, where x prime is inside of our interval going from x to x plus h. Now, if I take the limit as h goes to zero, okay, the length of this interval has gone to zero, so that interval is gonna go down to the point x because our function's continuous, okay, that's gonna mean that our f at x prime is gonna get driven to f of x. So it's by continuity. So that's gonna mean, if I take the derivative of capital F of x, we're gonna get little f of x, okay? And that's our result. Now, for the picture, what's happening here? Well, okay, this part, manipulation till we get to here, then you'll note the picture of this is just gonna look like, so this is the area under f of t between x and x plus h. Okay, so that's like that. Then this horizontal line here is just gonna be our mean value. So the idea is as we squeeze the length of this interval down to x, that's gonna push our mean value up to our point f of x is so. 